All right. Happy Sabbath, everybody. It's so good to be back here again. Last week went really quickly, um, and uh, but there was a lot last week for me. I don't know about you, but um, but nevertheless, it was like, wow, it's Sabbath again. Um, but uh, we always really look forward to getting back here on Sabbath because it's just like um, extended family. Um, the All of the members here... Um, it's so great to see uh, faces that we always see, and also new faces as well. So uh, welcome, everybody. Also want to welcome everybody that's on the um, joining on live stream here this morning. The program is going to be, um, we're going to have Abigail share the scripture reading. Uh, my son, Caleb, and myself, we're going to share the uh, special music this morning in Christ Alone. And Will has an interesting message titled, The Big If. Pastor, so Pastor Will is going to be sharing our message this morning. So definitely looking forward to that. What, what is the big if? I don't know. I'm, my curiosity is definitely perked at this point. But um, let's just open with prayer and uh, pray that uh, God will be with us and bless us in this service. Father in heaven, Lord, thank you so much for... Um, condescending to be with us and to join us. Lord, we can't go out or come in. Um, We cannot do anything without that miraculous transformation of our spirit and character and mindset. We pray for that here this morning so that Um, all of the bustle and the race of getting to this point, at this point, Lord, that we can just um, let all of that melt away and be neutralized even by your love and your peace, and so that we can receive the blessing that you have for us here today. This is our prayer, and we thank you so much, Lord, for hearing and answering. Amen. Good morning, happy Sabbath. Today's scripture reading is Luke 9, verses 23 through 25. And he said to all, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself?
thank you so much for all those who uh, participate in our service this morning. We appreciate especially our young people with their talents and their gifts that they shared with us. And also thank you all for wearing masks. You know, I, um, I've received some concerned members calling me and telling me, Pastor, we really need to all wear masks because we don't feel safe if we don't all wear masks. So I, I said, okay, and that's why in the messages out to the church, I really would like to recommend that we all wear masks. Some of us have been vaccinated and others have not, and I'm not going to be the judge on that. I would like to encourage all of us to get vaccinated, if at all possible, because it's also a recommendation of our health ministries department of the church. And um, we just don't know where this is going to go. You know, lately we get the reports of so many of our young people ending up in hospitals, in ICUs, and we want to make sure that we are safe and we keep them safe. So thank you. As much as we all hate this thing, this face covering, I appreciate you all working together and wearing that. Today is also a special day in that 20 years ago something dramatic happened today that not only impacted America, it impacted the whole world. I remember very distinctly, um, I arrived in the United States from South Africa in August of 2001. And uh, I was here for just over a month when the Tuesday morning I was sitting and working and um, I was staying with people in a little apartment in the back of the yard and the little girl came running to my door and knocked and said, Pastor Will, Pastor Will, you should turn the television on and watch the news, watch the news. An airplane flew into a building. So I turned it on and at first we thought it was an accident and of course then as it unfolded, we remember it was something way more um, cataclysmic than anyone could ever have imagined. So I would like to this morning just invite us all to stand and, and let us just observe just a moment as we reflect and as we pray for those impacted even after 20 years by that event. And while we stand, let us pray for all our men and women defending our country. Those overseas, our soldiers uh, who've lost their lives, thousands of them. Some are maimed for the rest of their lives. Some um, will never be able to continue their lives normally. So I would like us to just stand just for a moment as I pray in a special way for our country, for our leaders, and for our men in uniform. Shall we do that, please? <clears throat> Father, we thank you for the blessing we have to be living in a country as beautiful and with the freedoms we enjoy in the United States of America. We know our country is going through times of change, politically, socially, psychologically. But Lord, 20 years ago an event happened that changed the history of the world, so to speak. Right now we want to pause. And we want to uplift to you all those who were impacted by the events of that day. Little children had to grow up without fathers. Spouses who lost their loved ones. And that event that triggered thousands of our men and women in uniform to be deployed overseas to defend the freedoms and democracy that we take so often for granted in our country. We pray for your arms of safety and protection around them. We pray that you will bless them where they serve. We pray that you bless our leaders with wisdom and guidance, Lord. It's so easy to become rebellious against the government of the day and to point the finger at them. But Lord, it's not for us as your children to point fingers. In Romans 13, you, you remind us that we should pray for those in authority over us because no authority is there without God allowing it. So we pray that you bless our leaders and let us never forget that we as your children are citizens of the kingdom of heaven. But while we are on earth, help us to be good citizens of our country. 
to serve others, to reach out, and to represent Jesus as we follow you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. The big if, Isaac said he's curious. <laughs> But if you listen carefully to the scripture that Abigail shared with us, the if is right there. You know, I would like to share with you today about what it means to follow Jesus. And it's really in the words of Jesus himself. But the big if implies that there's a decision that people have to make. God doesn't force anyone. God is not going to coerce you into following him. And that is why Jesus in Luke chapter 9, 23, and this is really a continuation of our series in the book of Luke. Jesus said to them all, notice, he was not only speaking to one or two. He said to all of them, if anyone desires to come after me, if, that's a choice you have to make. Are we ready to make that choice? You know, Dietrich Bonhoeffer once said, of course, he's the famous Nazi or rather German theologian who was teaching a lot of people um, in a school in Germany leading up to the outbreak of World War II. And he himself died under the, uh, under the Nazi uh, regime. But Bonhoeffer made a statement in his day, and this was way back in the 1933s, and he said, the gospel that is preached today goes as follows. Of course you have sinned, but now everything is forgiven. So you can stay as you are and just enjoy the consolations of forgiveness. Bonifer had a concern with that. Because the main defect of such a proclamation is that it contains no demand or requirement for discipleship. Let me read it again. Of course you have sinned, but now everything is forgiven, so you can stay as you are. Right there is the mistake. And just enjoy the consolations of forgiveness. Why does God forgive sin? What is God's desire in forgiving sin? You know, it's interesting that when we look at the context of what Luke shares with us here, we find the same in the Gospel of Matthew and the Gospel of Mark. But for some reason, in the other two Gospels of Matthew and Mark, we have Jesus rebuking Peter. Because the setting was that Jesus had just fed the 5,000, and then he went with the disciples to a place up north, and he popped the question. He said, who do the crowds say that I am? Jesus was testing them. He wanted for them to understand who really, who really Jesus is. Did they understand his mission? Did they understand his personality? Do they understand the fact that he is the one sent from God? And Jesus was obviously leading up <clears throat> to the greater commitment that he wanted from them. So at first he wanted them to make sure that they knew who he was. So he started out with a generalization. Who did the crowd say I am? And of course, different disciples answered, well, some say Elijah, some say Jeremiah the prophet, others this, others that. And then Jesus zeroed in on the individual basis, and he said to them, but who do you, you, my disciples, who do you say that I am? It's one thing to tell Jesus what others think about him. It's one thing to share with Jesus the opinion of the world about him, or the opinion of the crowds about him, or the opinion that some church members have of him. But it's when the, per when the question becomes personal, when Jesus comes and he looks you in the face, and he puts his hand on your shoulder and says to you, But Jason, who do you say I am? Or Lal, who do you say I am? Or Nancy, who do you say I am? Jesus brings it personal. And it's out of this personal thought that, that Peter said, Lord, you are the Christ of God. Mark would translate it and say, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. 
And then Jesus said, you've said correctly, because upon this rock will I build my church. And the church would be built on the rock Jesus Christ. The church would be built on this very statement that Peter made. You know, for some reason, this was a confusing thought that came out that Pope Gregory the Great was the first to use the statement and to claim that it was the Apostle Peter that Jesus was referring to as a rock. No. Peter, Petros, only means a little pebble. Jesus talks about the rock, the Petra. He says, upon the rock will I build my church. And it's interesting, the word Petra is in the neuter, and it's actually feminine, because church is a feminine concept. It's the woman, the bride of Jesus. So it's obviously Jesus was talking about he will build his church on the rock, which is the statement Peter made. Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. Peter himself, in his own epistle, would write and say, Jesus is a cornerstone that was rejected by men, but become the foundation stone for his church. So once this was established... Luke, very interesting enough, does not even touch on the aspect of Jesus then telling Peter, I'm going to be crucified, and after three days I will be raised back to life. He excludes that from this discussion in chapter 9. Because Luke wants to zero right in on the next step that Jesus wants. And that is, now that you've made the statement, now that you know who I am, what I came for, now the next step is... What are you going to do about it? What consequence does this have for you as a person, as a group of followers of Jesus? So Jesus then turned and he said to them, if anyone desires to come after me. Now the word desire is very interesting there because when you desire the things of God, then you open yourself up to a change in your value system. It's Rick Warren who once said, when you desire your life in the light of eternity, then your values will change. When we want to be ready for Jesus to use us, when we, want, when we see our lives in the light of eternity, then our values will change. So what Jesus was telling them here is, if anyone desires to come after me, be ready for a change in your personal value system. You know, we all grow up with certain values. And it's interesting, Dwight Nelson once wrote a book, and in that book he has a chapter. The chapter is called, On Play Marbles with God. Maybe you've read it. And he says it's like a little child. You know, when a little child grows up, at a certain age, daddy is the hero. No one can play better marbles than daddy. No one can win battles like daddy. No one is more clever than daddy. Or no one cooks better food than mommy. Or no one is as beautiful as mommy. That old child will defend mom and dad at all costs because that's the value system. But now that child grows into a teenage year. And parents, you know what I'm talking about. We talk about the tough teen years because when, the te when, when children become teenagers... All of a sudden, they begin to challenge the value system, mom and dad. Dad will tell uh, uh, Tommy to do something. Tommy say, Dad, don't tell me what to do. I, Tommy, is, is, is that what I heard you say? When you were five years old, you never questioned what I said. But now, all of a sudden, you're questioning what I'm saying. Because young people reach an age when all of a sudden begin to question the value system they grew up with. And it's easy for parents to, at that point in time, blame their friends. Oh, it's since Tommy became friends with Johnny and the other crowd. That's why he's acting so disrespectful. Or it is since little Sally became friends with so-and-so. It's the bad influence of friends. Meanwhile, we have to accept the fact that our children have reached the age where they need to start developing their own value system. And they go through the rebel teen years. You know why? Because remember when you were a teenager, you tested your value system. I remember when I was a teenager, I once told my dad that, you know, I'm tired of just following what the church says. You know, I think I should follow my own way. And, and dad says, well, read the Bible. And if you find a different path, then follow that path. Well, now that I'm a pastor 
And I know what I believe, and I thank God for this beautiful, beautiful message that we can not only believe in, but also proclaim. I think back about that time, and I thought, you know, I was rebellious. I was rebelling because I didn't understand everything at the time. So when Jesus told them, if anyone desires to come after me, this is an invitation to reassess your value system as an individual. What do I deem important in my life? What is of value to me? In his book, The Purpose Driven Life, Rick Warren says, we all live with a certain metaphor in our lives. If all you want to do is have fun, then your life must be like a circus. You will look at all the things that give you fun. If you have a metaphor of want to be the best in sport, then of course you're going to be very active. You're going to be playing sport. You're going to try and achieve your best. You're going to practice. You're going to work hard. You're going to try and get ready for the Olympics. But if you are serious about God, it's a different approach. Then you will want to be more like Jesus. You will hunger for the things of God. You will obviously see your life in the light of eternity. And your values will begin to change because you all of a sudden realize, wait a minute, why am I here? Why did God put me here at this point in time, at this place on the world, and for what purpose? And that's when life begins to take on meaning. The purpose-driven life. Having said that, so Jesus made it interesting. He said to them, I want you to know that if you desire to come after me, there are three requirements. There are three prerequisites. And it's interesting when you analyze these three, they really follow in a logical order. What's the first step he said? Let him deny himself. Now, what does it mean to deny yourself? It's interesting when we look at self-denial, really the word that we can use as a synonym for denial is surrender. Now, surrender is the opposite of rebellion. When you analyze it carefully, when you, when you look at how many people live in rebelliousness, surrender is the opposite of that. Because surrender means you, you want to submit to a certain authority outside of yourself. So, the reason why it's so difficult for people today, especially in our American society, and I believe across the world as well, even in my old home country of South Africa, why it's so difficult to surrender is because we are in a certain sense very brainwashed by modern society. Because the brainwashing is this, oh, never give up, never give in, stand your ground. Defend your rights. Stand for your rights. Don't let anyone tell you anything else. We are brainwashed not to surrender. We are brainwashed not to give in. But when you analyze it very carefully, to surrender implies being willing to even become a loser. Now that doesn't sound nice, because who wants to be a loser? It's no wonder when people look at you and you're a Christian, they think you've kissed your brains goodbye. They think that you are weak. Now, Jesus did say in Matthew chapter 5, the Beatitudes, blessed are the meek, not the weak. Jesus never said you are weak because when you surrender to God, God becomes your strength. But what is meekness? Meekness, if you analyze the Greek word in the Beatitudes, meekness means authority and power under control. That means you surrender. So the first step, if you want to follow Jesus, is to stop rebelling against God, to stop defending your rights, to stop defending your agenda, and say, Lord, I want to surrender. But that doesn't come naturally. You need really a few steps to get to the point of surrender. And I would like to suggest that the very first step you need to do is you need to bring your life and your experience honestly before the Lord. Talk to God about your life. Share with God your concerns. 
Share with God your fears. Share with God your dreams. Share with God the things that that you are afraid of, that are intimidating to you. Share with God your concern about surrendering to Him because you are afraid of the reaction of others. You are also afraid that you may not make it. What if I surrender to Jesus and I still lose out on eternity? Well, that's why... In order to surrender, you can only surrender when you trust. And if you don't trust God, you can never surrender to him fully. Because without that trust, you're going to have the concern for failure. So bring your life honestly before God. Tell God about the desire you have. Tell God about your weakness. Tell God about your struggles. And then pray. Because prayer, I like the way that the book Steps to Christ puts it. Prayer doesn't take, uh, it, it, prayer doesn't bring God down to us. Prayer takes us up to God. It places us right in the vicinity, in the atmosphere of the Almighty. Prayer is elevating. Prayer can change things. You know, I, I can stand here today and, and, and I know. I, I don't think my wife Judy would, would uh, mind me saying this. As you know, she had a heart attack in March of this year. And uh, she had to go through some cardio rehab. And uh, at the time, when they did the test on her with that, I think it's an electro-magno machine, and I was in a, in a room when they connected the heart to it, and the person said to her, any time you have a heart attack, there is damage to the heart muscle. And that's why you need to do cardio rehab. But I thank God that prayer was answered for my wife a week ago because she went for a test and the cardiologist sent her a message and said, good news, your heart function is normal. No sign of heart muscle damage. Prayer is powerful, my friends. Prayer can change things. And that's why we cannot surrender unless... We come to God on our knees and we become meek as it is. Because that's when Romans chapter 12 comes to mind. Remember the words of the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 12. If you have your Bible, I invite you to turn with me to Romans chapter 12. And look at what Paul advises us to do in Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And then look at verse 2. And do not be conformed to this world. Let me pause there. Remember what I just told you? We live in a society where we are brainwashed against surrender. We are brainwashed against meekness. Because we want to empower the individual. We want to empower the individual and think, you are almighty. And unfortunately, if you listen to some of these television ministries and preachers going on, it's all about you. It's all about empowering the individual. It's all about making you stronger. So much so that at some point you think, I don't need God anymore. No wonder we come to the final generation in this world that is symbolized by the message to the church of Laodicea in Revelation chapter 3 verse 20. And the the argument is, God, I don't need you. I'm rich and I've enriched myself and I have need of nothing. It's a generation that feels it has become independent of God. They don't need God anymore. It's, it's, a, it's a generation saturated with knowledge. We have all the arguments figured out. We have all the answers ready. So why would we surrender? But that's why Paul says, Do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect, the will of God. He says, be willing to be transformed. Be willing to change. Transformation is all about change. 
And that's why Jesus, as a very first step, said, if you desire to follow me, the big if means, am I ready to change? Are you really willing to change? But you come and you make, you make the approach and you bring your life honestly before God. You pray. And then once you've realized that you can trust God and you can, and you can really allow him to transfer your mind, then you surrender your will to him. Are we willing to be made willing? Are we willing to allow God's Holy Spirit to change? And change is not always easy. Change can be difficult. And that's why it brings us to the next step. Because Jesus knew change was not going to happen naturally. So what is a step that follows after denying self? Jesus says, then you need to take up your cross and do what? And follow me. But there's a little word that we left out. Take up your cross daily. Now the word daily is very significant here. Because one author pointed out and said the fact that the term daily enters here means it is not a historical event only. It's an ongoing process. What is interesting is when Jesus says I want you to to really... um, Not only deny yourself, which means you surrender to God, but when you surrender to God and you are willing for God to change you and you're willing for the Lord to to bring about the value system change, a transformation in your mind, in your heart, then that transformation will motivate you to take up your cross. Now, it's interesting that the term cross... At the time when Jesus spoke this was not an unfamiliar term with the people of his day. As a matter of fact, we go so far back as the Roman historian Tacitus would write and say around the year 4 BC. Now Jesus was born around 4 or 5 BC. So around the time of Jesus' birth, there was a revolt on the Spartacus. And the Roman authorities crucified 6,000 of Spartacus' men publicly. The Romans crucified prisoners and criminals publicly. And part of that was that as a convicted criminal of the Roman Empire, you had to carry the cross beam, the patibulum, they called it. You had to, they placed it on your shoulder and you had to take it and carry it through the streets and they would usually find a place. That's why they took Jesus out and they crucified him on top of the hill with the two criminals because they wanted to make a public spectacle of him. What does that imply? Why is it necessary for a person to take a cross and walk through the streets in full view of the people? Because in the Roman authorities' mind, they wanted the people to see that here is a person who once rebelled against the authority of Rome, but now he is submissive. Now he is going to pay the price for his rebellion. The only difference is Jesus did not say, this cross will be placed upon you. God isn't going to place a cross on you. That's why we need to read carefully. Jesus says, let him take up his cross. We need to take up the cross. I need to take up my cross. Why? Because God isn't going to force you to stop rebelling against him. But if you choose to follow Jesus and you take up your cross, what it implies is, Lord, I rebelled against you. I've gone against you throughout my life, but I've reached a point now where I'm surrendering, and in surrendering, I'm even willing to give you my life. And that's why I take my cross daily. No one puts it on me. I pick it up because it's a choice of my own decision-making. And then you walk with it daily. It brings to mind what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 31, where Paul says, And brethren, because of all this, I die daily. What does that mean? It means when I surrender, I need to die daily to all the things that can cause me to rebel against God. 
You know, it's interesting when you come to Romans chapter 8. In Romans chapter 8, we have a description there where, where the Bible describes what, what will happen, or rather Romans chapter, chapter 6. When, um, when we come to the point where, where we know that, you know, this is something that, that is going to be very demanding of us. Romans chapter 6 talks about we die to the old man. It's really a beautiful chapter on what it means to die. And the argument that Paul uses in Romans chapter 6 is in Romans chapter 5, he spoke about how all have sinned in Adam and sin has penetrated the whole human race. Then in Romans chapter 6, he tells us what we can do about that. He says you can die to that old life. You can actually give your life over. And then in Romans chapter 7, he tells us that even though you have been baptized, even though you have been crucified with Jesus and you've died in his death, the struggle still continues. Baptism is not the magical formula to make you holy. Baptism is only the new birth. You need to learn to walk again. You need to launch out and follow Jesus. So the struggle is still there, even after baptism. And that's why in Romans chapter 7, he says, I still struggle with these things. And then comes Romans chapter 8. And I want you to look at verse 7 through 9. In Romans 8, he says, because the carnal mind is enmity against God. What's he saying? What's the definition of enmity? Rebellion. It means I reject and I oppose. He says, our, our human mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, which means it cannot surrender, nor indeed can it. So then, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. And if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he is not his. So what's Paul saying? That's why in Romans 12 he says, be transformed in your mind. Because you need to stop pursuing your own agenda. And you need to trust God enough to allow the Holy Spirit to come into your heart. And say, Lord, not my will be done. Thy will be done. And the moment we get to that point, we die daily. Daily we start and say, Lord, you fill me today. You guide me today. I need your Holy Spirit. And even if that means the Spirit will lead me to places where I never anticipated to be led to, I trust you enough with that. And that is what it means to take up the cross daily. It means to daily recognize that there's a battle ongoing between the carnal mind and the Spirit of God. There's always this human aspect for as long as we are on this side of eternity that will act and rebel and be in opposition to what God wants for us. And that's why we need to die daily. It's a new surrender every day. And then Jesus went one step further. He said, you know, I want you to know that once you have denied yourself, once you've made the decision to surrender, and now you die daily, you, you give yourself daily, you take up the cross and taking up the cross means you are, you, are, you are making an end to all the kinds of rebellion you might have against God. And you surrender. And you actually put yourself under the authority of God and under the Holy Spirit for that day. So that God can lead you. Because all those who are led by the Spirit, they are children of God. Then comes the next step. Follow me. Because to follow Jesus means that you open yourself up to a life of obedience. Jesus did not say, deny yourself, take up your cross, and just follow your own path. No. When you desire the things of God, you need to walk the way Jesus walked. You know, there's a, there's, there's a statement that I found in the book Desire of Ages, page 417. And when I read it at first, it really hit me. I've read that book a few times. But when I read it this past week while I was preparing for the message today, this statement 
just hit me and I had to stop and read it again. And this is what it says on page 417. Jesus did not count heaven a place to be desired while we were lost. And I thought to myself, wow. I remember the story of a man and his wife who once, I'm not sure if they played Wheel of Fortune on TV or what they did, but they won a trip to a beautiful exotic island. And they were going to be away for two weeks. Only condition was the children couldn't go along. So the kids had to stay with mom, with grandma at home. Sister Anna Melinda, you know the feeling, right? Mom and dad are off, so they arrived at the airport. Their luggage was packed. They were ready. They were excited. And mom wiped away some tears like Sandy. I remember you said, I'd like you to see your family came back. You wiped your tears, and you knew they were good. They were going to be safe with mama. So you and hubby get on the plane, and off you go to this exotic island. And for two weeks, it's going to be bliss. And in the plane, she was saying, oh, I hope Johnny will be okay. And he said, John will be okay because mama will take care of him. And hey, hey, listen, let's look at it positively. We are away from the kids. Let's have fun. Let's have a, a second honeymoon. Well, the first three days went fine. They were snorkeling and they were sunbathing and they were doing things. And by the end of the third day, it started eating them. It's a beautiful place where we are, it's an exotic island. But how we wish our kids could be here with us. We want to share our experience with them. We want them to come and, and let's all have a family beach vacation. And, and you know, we, we just want to make sure they're okay. And I want to tuck them in at night and I want to kiss them good night and I want to have them with us. Not that we don't trust grandma with taking care of them, but we just miss them so much. And I can identify with that because, as you know, my two grandsons are in Perth, Australia. The youngest one just turned a year old in July, and I've never held him, never touched him. I, had, I, I haven't had a chance to go and visit, or neither could they come and visit because of COVID. But thank God for WhatsApp video that I can communicate with my daughter from time to time. But here's the point I want to make. Just like that family missed being with their children. The statement is, Jesus did not count heaven a place to be desired while we were lost. No wonder John 3.16 says, God so loved the world that he gave. And no wonder that Jesus says, I desire that all those, this, that's a pretty prayer in John 17, and Father, I desire that all those you gave me might be with me and with you where we are. There's a desire in the heart of God for you. Where you are sitting right now, there's a desire in the heart of God for you to be with him in heaven. There's a desire in the heart of God for each one of us to be followers of Jesus. Jesus did not count heaven a place to be desired while we were lost. He left the heavenly courts for a life of reproach and insult and a death of shame. He who was rich in heaven's priceless treasure became poor, that through his poverty we might be rich. We are to follow in the path he trod. The requirement that Jesus gave is, if you desire, if you share the desire that I have for you to be together, if you have that same desire, then surrender. Allow God to change your mindset. Allow God to change your life. Allow God to bring you a value system that will resonate with heaven and the lifestyle of heaven. Because this world is a preparation for the life that God has in store for us. And then follow me. Follow me, oh, to follow Jesus. It's interesting that the first two statements, in the Greek you have different tenses. To deny self and to take up the cross daily are in the aorist tense, which means it's 
It started at a point and it's continuing after that point. It's a punctiliar past tense kind of sense. But when it comes to following, it's in the, it's in the present continuous. It means it's a daily, daily walk with Jesus. Daily walk with him. It reminds me of Enoch. Remember the Bible says in the book of Genesis, Enoch walked with God. And then he was no longer found because God took him. I can imagine. Enoch walked out one morning and he was just praising God and singing praises. And, and he talked to God one on one like a man would talk to a friend. And, and he said, okay, Lord, it's, it's time for me to go back. And God says, you want to go home? Why don't you just come with me? Let's go home together. That's what God wants to do one day when he comes again. It's David who said in Psalm 119, verse 97, How I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. Because when we have a desire for the things of God, when we surrender to God, the law of God will not be a problem. Because when we realize the law of God is there to protect us and to shield us from harm and to help us to respect others and to love others, then why would it be a problem to follow Jesus each day? He came to pour out his life for others, and we can do the same. So, the big if is, if you're ready, if your desire is to be with Jesus, that's what's going to take. Surrender. Stop rebelling and follow. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for the practical steps that you gave us in Luke chapter 9, 23 to 25. We know that the battle that we all have is really a battle of the mind. Where the carnal mind is always in conflict with the Holy Spirit. And we want to come and we want to surrender to you, Lord, because we desire to be with God. We invite you, Lord, please come and work in us. May the Holy Spirit be unleashed when we surrender ourselves to you and when we take up our cross daily to die to our own ideas, our own agenda, our own way of doing things. And allow you to open our eyes for the things that have greater reality. And then to follow you. To walk in the footsteps of Jesus. To follow your example. To live our lives in service to others and in love to God and our fellow man. Lord, this world is hungry. Not for more money. Not for more material things. This world is hungry for a practical demonstration of God's love. And you have called us as your children to make Jesus visible wherever we walk, wherever we go, wherever we are. So use us as your disciples and bless us as we Take the steps to follow you in Jesus' name. Amen.